John Krampner, the author of Creamy and Crunchy, to ask him if he wouldn't mind coming on on a holiday weekend. <laughs> and John said, not at all. Hey, John, welcome to the program. Uh, good morning, Randall. Great to have you with us. We really appreciate you doing it on this holiday weekend. Now, uh, I noticed because I placed the call, we gave uh, our our typical producer uh, on a on a normal Sunday, Cora, the day off because she went down to Disneyland uh, with her family. Disneyland, right, Anthony? Cora, yeah. No, she yeah. Went to San Diego. Oh, she went to San Diego. I'm sorry. Disneyland was a couple of weeks ago. She's constantly on the go with all of her kids. But at any rate, she's not here. So I placed the call and I noticed it was a 323 area code. So you are here in the Golden State with us. I am indeed. I'm in Los Angeles. Yes, and a beautiful day down in Los Angeles. Believe it or not, San Luis Obispo, where we broadcast from, it will be a little warmer than L.A. today. We're expected to hit a high of uh, 79 degrees, uh, mid-60s to the north of us, but I noticed L.A. will be in the uh, mid to low 70s. So, But sunshine across the board for all of us. Hey, John, uh, how did you get the idea to write this book about peanut butter? Well, interestingly, um, I don't really have a very strong food pedigree, uh, my first two books were uh, entertainment biographies. Uh, the first of a man named uh, Fred Coe, who was the leading producer of 1950s live television drama. Mm. And then uh, Kim Stanley, who was a Broadway actress at the same time. Uh, both of them were uh, tormented geniuses in the arts who lapsed into obscurity because of drinking problems. And I thought I'd like to write uh, about something a little more cheerful this time. <laughs> and. Right. Uh, uh, peanut butter may make you fat, but it won't give you cirrhosis of the liver. Oh, that's true, right? So there's a plus. <laughs> and so you landed on uh, peanut butter. Have you always been a big peanut butter fan? Well, off and on, to be honest with you, as uh, when I was growing up, uh, it was really one of only two foods that I would eat with any regularity to my mother's distress, the other being <laughs> hamburgers. Oh, okay. And, uh, but when I went away to college, uh, I stopped eating it because I just wanted to see what else the world uh, held gastronomically. But then in the uh, early 1980s, after a very uh, painful romance ended, as some people do, uh, I just uh, turned to it as a way of uh, 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 trying to... Uh, uh, to Feel forget better. about my uh, my romantic problems, I then gained so much weight that I had to uh, go to the gym, go to a nutritionist, and uh, I stopped eating it again. And I really didn't begin uh, eating it again until I started doing the research for this book. And of course, now I only eat it for research purposes. <laughs> right. You know, I. it's funny that you stopped eating it in college. I really started eating peanut butter in college, uh, primarily because it was an inexpensive protein source. Uh, but what I, what I really got into in college, I remember, is... Uh, doing peanut butter and jelly on toast, uh, toasting mm -hmm. the bread. And then, you know, the peanut butter melts a little bit and uh, uh, just, oh, yum. Thinking about it right it, now, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> no, it, it, it just uh, that uh, that molten quality that the peanut butter acquires on, on toast is uh, just really one of life's great pleasures. It does. Hey, so how long did it take you to uh, research the book and then write it? Uh, it took about uh, five years. It, um, again, I um, really had to uh, uh, just kind of start from, um, um, start from the beginning, in a mm -hmm. sense. I, uh, uh, I had never had much of a, a food background. Um, I um, interviewed a lot of people from the peanut and peanut butter industries. I plunged into library stacks, went on the Internet, uh, I made uh, several trips to uh, the peanut-growing uh, regions of the South, and I was lucky enough to uh, connect with a uh, retired uh, peanut farmer in uh, Jackson County uh, in the Florida Panhandle named Stanley Pittman, uh, who showed me around, uh, took me out into the fields to peanut buying points. And uh, again, Jackson County, I mean, it's about as rural as you can get in Florida. It's about 50 people per square mile. Uh, Manhattan, by way of contrast, is about 70,000 people uh, per square mile. 
I um, I sampled so many different kinds of uh, peanut butter. I have this uh, collection of peanut butter jars in my living room, which um, one editor who came to introduce me uh, to interview me rather, he referred to it as my shrine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, I grew my own peanut patch and made uh, peanut butter out of it. I just in Los Angeles, it, you grew peanuts. Oh sure, it's uh, it's uh, we we have the weather for basically to grow peanuts. You you need two things. One is uh, warm weather, and uh, the other is kind of a sandy loam soil. Which uh-huh. actually, I'm not sure that's what we have in front of my apartment building, but it it, it was good enough for the purpose. And, uh, is it a large plant? Uh, no, it's uh, it's not that large at all. What um, it has kind of um, kind of these oval leaves. They're sort of gray green, and as is the custom with legumes, they they fold up against each other at night. What's really interesting about the peanut plant, um, it produces these small kind of uh, almost orchid-like yellow orange. Flowers. Oh. Uh, they they live for about a day. Uh, they then uh, kind of die and turn downwards, burrow into the soil, and that's where they produce the peanut. So the peanut plant is one of a very small number of plants in the peanut world where it flowers above ground, but then fruits below ground. Interesting, and and I noticed that you called it a legume, which means we always call them, we say peanut, but it's technically not a nut. That is correct. Uh, to uh, to actually be a nut, it uh, has to have a hard shell and grow on a tree, like walnuts and almonds. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way that uh, peanuts are prepared is uh, you know pretty much the way that that nuts are prepared. So it's kind of uh, People have gotten the habit of, of calling that, but you know, nobody prepares peanuts the way you do uh, green peas or anything like right. that. Although uh, it's uh, it's it's more closely related to the pea than it is to the almond or the walnut. Now, in the South, where you were traveling, I always think of Georgia when I think of peanut farming. But uh, of course, it it goes beyond those borders, like you said, the Panhandle of Florida and such uh, rural areas where. On the roadside, don't you see boiled peanuts? Aren't people selling? I had read that somewhere. That is absolutely true. Uh, in the South, um, uh, boiled peanuts are uh, considered quite the delicacy. And uh, when we were uh, driving through uh, Jackson County, we we did run across a um, a stand of someone just uh, under a canopy selling boiled peanuts. Um, they are popular in the South. I, I have to tell you, um, I personally can't abide them at all. They, uh, they, they just seem kind of, kind of greasy and slug-like, but uh-huh. they are Slug-like. popular oh. in the South, but, uh, give me peanut butter with, uh, with its roasted peanut flavor any day. Yeah, I have to agree. We're speaking with John Krampner, author of Creamy and Crunchy. It is the go-to book for anyone who loves peanut butter, which I put myself in that camp for sure. Uh, We will keep John on the line and uh, ask him more questions regarding the history of peanut butter. Who invented it after all? It's an American original, that's for sure. 944 the time. If you have any questions regarding peanut butter, email them to us now, radio at eatdrinkexplore.com. We're back in just a moment on this Sunday morning, 944. Welcome back to the program on this Sunday morning. It is our final segment, November the 25th, as we broadcast live, 9.49 the time here in California. Uh, Talking with John Krampner, the author of Creamy and Crunchy. It is a peanut butter Bible. (laughs) And uh, we were in the middle of uh, speaking with John about some of the different aspects of peanut butter. And uh, I'm wondering, John, what was your biggest discovery while working on this book? Well, it, um, there were actually uh, several. The uh, one is that um, when, 
when I was growing up in the early 60s, uh, peanut butter uh, was mainly made from a combination of uh, Virginia and Spanish uh, peanuts. Uh, Spanish are very flavorful. They would put the Virginia in because it had lower oil content, so to kind of balance it out, not make it too oily. And I didn't realize that starting in the early 1970s, the kind of uh, peanut uh, used in peanut butter switched to the runner peanut. Runners aren't uh, quite as flavorful, although the uh, hybrid that they uh, had in the early 70s uh, called the flow runner was a bit more uh, uh, a bit more tasty than runners had traditionally been. But I didn't realize that in the uh, in the course of my lifetime that the kind of peanut used to make uh, peanut butter had had changed. And when I started eating peanut butter again, it seemed a little different. But I thought that uh, maybe I was just being a, a rank sentimentalist and right. kind of going, "Well, you know, <laughs> in the good old days." But uh, it really is uh, different now, and that was kind of my biggest surprise. Interesting. You know, your book is titled Creamy or or Creamy and Crunchy. Uh, but in terms of creamy or crunchy, what which style do Americans buy more of? Oh, uh, by far and away, the hands down winner is uh, is creamy. Oh. Uh, it's about eighty uh, percent of the market. Uh, crunchy is it's about seventeen percent now, and the remaining three is. Uh, that stuff where they mix peanut butter and jelly in the same jar. Right. Um, I'm a little surprised. I'm, I'm a crunchy person uh, myself. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other uh, thing that I've uh, learned, though, is that apparently uh, women and children tend to prefer creamy and men tend to prefer uh, crunchy. Oh, that's interesting. Where do you get these sorts of statistics? Uh, the... Uh, at this point, to be honest with you, I've done so much research, I just <laughs> it's can't hard to pull remember. that one off the top of my head. <laughs> That's okay. I, we know it has been more than a decade since I have purchased, I'd say maybe more than 20 years, since I've purchased peanut butter that's stabilized, that, uh, you know... Mm-hmm. doesn't separate in the jar i've right. been buying natural i look on the label and it needs to say peanuts and salt uh and yeah. that is all i buy in fact uh anthony our, who does our audio here grinds his own peanut butter <laughs> wow yeah so um but i'm wondering am i odd that way the stabilized is probably far more popular because the big giant brands like jiff and skippy yes out sell uh, the others yeah, you're you're not odd, but in my opinion, you're wise. I mean, I uh, um, I do the same thing. I uh, almost exclusively eat uh, the natural peanut butter, uh, and I do so for a number of reasons. And again, I'm speaking as somebody who grew up on Skippy. The uh, the first is that with uh, uh, natural or old fashioned. The uh, the peanut flavor and aroma are just much more intense. Right. Now, um, a lot of people think that the uh, the hydrogenated oils in uh, in stabilized peanut butter have a lot of trans fats in them. That is not true. Uh, the uh, there's only a minuscule amount of, of trans fats oh. uh, in stabilized peanut butter. So that's not that's really not a big problem. But again, what the uh, stabilized oils do is they they muffle uh, the the flavor and and the aroma of the peanuts. And um, the main reason, of course, that the companies uh, do that, that put the stabilized oils in, is for a a commercial imperative, not a taste or flavor imperative. Right. It uh, it extends the shelf life of the product. And uh, and just you know makes for more profit. Right. Uh, let me tell you one thing about stabilized peanut butter, which your listeners may not realize, though, which is that uh, it is almost invariably genetically modified. Oh, interesting. The stabilized because they use like a canola oil or something. Well, not. I'm not sure what the statistics are in canola oil, but the um, 
the uh, the cotton oil and the soybean oil right. is almost invariably genetically modified. Interesting. Another reason why I choose the natural version. Hey, John, where does the where did peanut butter start? Who is was there? Is there someone we can pinpoint as an inventor? Well, there's kind of a two part answer to that. Now, peanuts are native to the uh, Bolivian foothills of the eastern Andes. They so thousands of years ago, you know, the Incas were were grinding up peanuts, mm -hmm. although they didn't, you know, spread it on bread the way we do. Uh, in its modern incarnation, uh, peanut butter originates in the American Midwest, although there are really uh, two schools of thought as to who deserves the credit for that. Uh, actually, three, if you count George Washington Carver, who does not deserve the credit at all. Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, right. He's uh, uh, not only did he not invent peanut butter, he, uh, he even his his knowledge of peanuts is is, is overrated. I was uh, surprised when I read his uh, book on 105 ways to prepare the peanut that he says it grows best in uh, clay soil, which it doesn't. It's uh, it's sandy loam, but anyway, uh, serious uh, peanut butter people either give the credit to um, John Harvey Kellogg, who uh, was one of the founders of the uh, the Kellogg cereal dynasty. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. um, he took out the first uh, patent on a peanut butter-like substance in uh, 1895, although if you read that patent, again, he boiled the peanuts. He didn't roast them. So uh, other people say uh, the credit really should go to a man named George Bale, B-A-Y-L-E, who was a snack food manufacturer in St. Louis and who claims to have uh, been making peanut butter commercially as early as 1894. Um, and so there's still a uh, controversy about that. About so. who, who the original person was. John Krampner, Creamy and Crunchy. You can go to creamyandcrunchy.com for a lot more information. Perfect book for the foodie on your holiday shopping list. John, thanks for joining us today. It was very much a pleasure, Randall. Thank you very much. And everyone enjoy the remainder of your holiday weekend. Eat, Drink, Explore Radio. You've been listening to the Eat, Drink, Explore radio program. If you missed any of our segments today, look for them online or through our free Apple and Android apps. Catch you back right here next week.